Hello, my name is Tom Harmon. Nothing special about me or that name. I just uh, claim to be a sinner saved by the grace of God and uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. What I'm about to do is a new venture of faith for me. Uh, since we're quarantined, I'd like to do a, a video message or several video messages at our dining room table on my wife's phone. So many times as a preacher, I would want to look people over before I got ready to look at my notes and preach, but there's nobody but my wife here. So um, I'll just look at the screen and do the best I can. The reason I'm doing this is uh, I do want to encourage believers in their faith and to present a clear understanding of the hope of the gospel. I've recently retired from itinerant preaching and I hear about doctors, nurses, medical professionals that are coming out of retirement to help in this time of crisis and I think maybe that's an inspiration to me to say well do what you can. We're quarantined but the Word of God is not bound so I'd like to just present some some truths from the Word of God that have been such a help to me and a strength to my faith over the years. I'd like to do a short series of messages, the first three of them being on the foundation of our faith. The basics that never change. We get away from the basics and uh, we seem to get into trouble. In these shaky times, we need something solid to hang on to. When things begin to kind of tremor, people look for something solid to grab onto to, to help them. Well, Jesus um, told a parable of two builders. In Luke chapter 6 verses 46 through 49 he said uh, two men were getting ready to build. The one built his house and he took the time, dug deep, and laid his foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the storm beat vehemently against the house it couldn't even shake it because it was founded upon the rock. Now the second builder was in too big of a hurry, didn't take the time to get down to bedrock to build his house on. And same thing, storm arose, flood arose, the storm beat vehemently against the house, and immediately the house fell and great was the ruin of that house. Success or failure from that parable was dependent, I mean inseparably related to the foundation. Any builder will tell you the most important part of any building is the foundation. If the foundations go down, everything above it goes down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 we read, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. God himself laid the foundation for our faith. In Isaiah 28 16, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold I lay in Zion, for a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. I just love that. A sure foundation. He that believeth on him shall not be troubled or disturbed. This precious cornerstone is also called the Word of God. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on in that chapter... In verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying for His disciples, and He's not too far from the cross. And He says, Oh Father, I pray that you, you don't take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. Lord, I pray that um, you would sanctify them through your truth. And then he makes it real clear. Your word is truth. Oh, how foundational to our Christian faith is the unshakable confidence that the Bible is truly the eternal word of God. Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus said, but my words shall not pass away. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. And I love this next part. Which lives and abides forever. 
And he goes on to say, for all flesh is like grass. It's seasonal. Springtime it won't be long. We'll be getting out our lawnmowers and the grass will grow. And before we know it, we'll be putting our lawnmowers up. Another season will have passed. It's a verse that talks about the brevity of life. And then it says, and the glory of man, all the things that seem to make us want to have importance or significance, is like the flower of the field. It passes away even quicker. And then he goes on to say, but the word of God is eternal. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. The eternal word of God. Oh, how how we need to build a confidence that the Bible is in fact true. It's always been under attack. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Everybody has faith, but it's the object of our faith that makes the difference. The Bible tells us the object of our faith. It's repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. And God has given us his word to tell us those things. It's our sword in the battle. It's the life-giving bread to our souls. It's the light for our path and the key to our freedom. When you know the truth, the truth will make you free and you'll be free indeed. There's a great old hymn that I still sing from time to time. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? You who to Jesus for refuge have fled. One of the most foundational truths of the Christian faith is understanding the doctrine or the teaching of imputed righteousness. I was very slow in getting this, but when I did, it was like a nitrous button for my faith. Matthew 5.20, the scene, let me give it to you. Sermon on the Mount, there's a large crowd. Everything is in that crowd from soup to nuts. Sinners of all kinds, pimps, prostitutes, pickpockets, tax collectors, the skeptic, the cynic, the greedy, the boaster, the backslider, and the backbiter, the angry, the religious, the indifferent, the self-righteous, and the selfish. They're all there. Jesus pointed to a group of Pharisees that seemed to be coming down among the group and he said to this group, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> they must have felt like their ship was just sunk. <laughs> they came hoping to hear something that would give them hope. And instead, that statement must have sent despair through the whole group because they looked at the, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the people who made their living copying the Word of God. If anybody knew what the Word of God was, it would be the scribes. And the Pharisees, they were the most religiously influential people in the Jewish culture. They were at the top of the pile. pile. And he said, you've got to do better than them if you're going to make it to heaven. To further make his point, he doesn't let up. In the next verse, he said, you've heard that it's been said by them of old, thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. And then he goes on. He doesn't drop it. He says, you've heard that it's been said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if a man just looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. So now they think, if you haven't committed the act, if you only think it, you're guilty. They knew there wasn't a person there that hadn't been guilty of being angry of immoral thinking. They must have really felt discouraged. Paul says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, I love that, he starts out New Testament scripture by referring to the Old Testament and he's quoting David in Psalms 14, one through three, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, they're all gone out of the way. And he goes down through these verses, it just says, in ourselves, we are helplessly, hopelessly lost. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have carried us away. Paul had a great burden for the Jewish people. Romans 10, 1 through 4. 
He said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The law demands perfect righteousness, and so does God. The problem isn't with the law. The law is a direct reflection of the character and holiness of God. It demands perfection. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? How many things do you have to steal to be a thief? He makes it clear, you're not to commit adultery in moderation. It's an absolute. And he goes down through these commandments, no other God, don't take his name in vain, don't take it lightly. And we fail at it. But yet that's exactly what God demanded. Jesus didn't come to earth to destroy the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them. And he fulfilled them. He lived a perfectly righteous life under the law. Paul said this in Philippians 3, 9, not having my own righteousness, which is after the law. He said, I can't do it that way. But he said, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5 21 he drum rolls this he said for he that's God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5 12 wherefore as by one man Adam sin entered into the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. A little later in that same chapter Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, even so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Simply said, another man's sin made me a sinner, and it's going to take another man's righteousness to make me righteous. When you stand before God, will you be able to boast in your righteousness? 1 Corinthians 1, 29 through 31 says that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. According it is written, let him who glorieth glory in the Lord. Jeremiah says the same thing, because it starts out as it is written again. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glorieth glory in this, that he knoweth and understandeth me, that I am God, and that I execute, exercise righteousness, judgment in the earth. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. Paul reminds young T Titus in chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he hath saved us. Mercy. As I prepared this earlier, I wept at this. I'm saved and made right with God because of his mercy, not because of any righteousness I have at all, but only the righteousness that he gave me in Christ. The only thing that stands between me and the hell I deserve is the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to me or given to me or placed on my account. I'll never deserve it. I'll never be able to earn it. And yet it's a gift of His grace. Well, it's been said, never waste a crisis. This quarantine is good for me. For if I'm re reminded of the fact that the Word of God is not bound, it is still living and powerful. Our next message will be uh, on the doctrine of justification. So until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.